there's very little homogeneity across different fields, even though they might be looking at pretty similar questions conceptually in terms of how data are analyzed. Again, usually there's no registration of uh, what were the main hypotheses. And um, data sharing does happen more often compared to the small world data environment. But much of the time, it is not really understood what exactly is being shared. Not, not only the recipients of the data do not understand what is being shared, very often not even the data generators do not understand what exactly they share. And you know, these databases are just so black box looking that it's very difficult to understand. <clears throat> Empirical studies across different fields where we have performed replications suggest that the replication rate is not very high. And many fields have seen replication as a me-too type of research that should not be funded, that should be avoided, that no one should waste their time with. But many other fields have run replications for various reasons. One such field, for example, is human genome epidemiology. And, and the reasons are manifold, but practically in human genome epidemiology, the cost of running experiments decreased about 100 million fold over the years, uh, with genotyping becoming very cheap we could create very large consortia of multiple teams with huge sample sizes. Now we have biobanks that even raise the bar even higher. And it, it was very easy and very natural to start looking in large scale across the genome with rigorous statistical methods and replicating at no cost whatever had been published in the past. So if you compare the 40,000 papers of the quote unquote Canada gene era when people we're discovering one gene at a time for one phenotype at a time versus what these same gene associations for the Canada genes came up in replication in large consortia of GWAS. Only 1.2% of these Canada gene associations that had been published in the very top creme de la creme journals in the Canada gene era really withstood replication. Now, one might say that uh, uh, John, uh, you were working in human genome epidemiologists and you were doing this because you're stupid and human genome epidemiologists are, are dumb and uh, everybody else is very smart and, and therefore the reproducibility rate would be much higher in other fields that think more carefully and are, are having better insights about biological plausibility compared to you. Th that's one explanation. Uh, the other explanation is that yes, I'm probably dumb, but I think my colleagues in human genome epidemiology are very smart and very carefully thinking about uh, methods and uh, also biology. And I don't think that things would be really substantially different in other fields. It doesn't seem that they're different in other fields. Uh, so if you go to preclinical research, there's uh, several empirical evaluations, most of them led by industry investigators, but increasingly also done by other teams that have shown that the reproducibility of preclinical results ranges from zero to 20%. And why did the industry get involved in this? Well, because if they get a lead from an academic paper published in a major journal saying that this is a wonderful new drug target and this can be easily developed into a new treatment, they will spend half a billion dollars, one billion dollars, two billion dollars to try to develop that. And if it's not a genuinely good lead, they will just waste that money. So they wanted to see how often they can make these things work, and they just couldn't make these things work. Last week, uh, my fourth grade daughter, Joni, brought home her assignment of learning what science is all about. Uh, and it described a lot of things that are familiar. Scientists are curious about problems, they make observations in the world, they generate a question that they want to investigate, they design a way to study that question, they do collect some data, then they write about what they found and they share it with others. And then other scientists mm -hmm. talk about it and da 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 da. Nowhere in her assignment did it say, scientists spend all their time writing grants, uh, they have to churn out as many papers as they can, uh, and so it took me a while to convince her that science wasn't like that at all uh, and describe all the things that science was, and she lost interest about five seconds into that conversation. The, see, she's still upset about it. Uh, the uh, challenge, of course, that 
the ideals of how we think about science, how we educate what science is as a methodology, are sometimes in conflict with the realities of what it takes to have a career in science. And that potential gap uh, between what we want science to be and how we have to do it uh, in order to succeed involves a lot of stakeholders that, have, that drive incentives. What does it take for me as a researcher to survive and thrive in science? And the major stakeholders in that are the granting agencies, right? Who gets the money uh, to continue doing the science? It's the journals and publishers who gets through the pipeline in order to present their work in an outlet that will advance their career in some way by being prestigious or getting attention or otherwise. And then the institutional responsibility, as we were talking about for this panel, is who gets hired and who gets promoted and tenured. And what are the things that are expected of scientists in order to get hired and promoted and tenured? And that's what I want to focus on as the problem uh, given the panel discussion uh, this, this morning. And as we are aware, and as John's opening keynote uh, put a point on, is that publication is really the currency of scientific advancement. The more that I publish and the more prestigious those publications, the more I will be rewarded regardless of its accuracy. Now accuracy, of course, is something that I want, but it is not necessarily directly incentivized. And because publication is the currency of advancement, there are some things that are more publishable than other things. I'm more likely to get published if I get a positive result than a negative result. I'm more likely to get published if I have a novel finding rather than something that repeats something that someone else has done. And I'm more likely to get published with a neat and tidy story where all of the research lines up and reinforces a very clear conceptual conclusion, as opposed to one that shows lots of exceptions and loose ends and things that don't quite make sense uh, in the theoretical narrative under understanding the finding. So a novel, positive, tidy story is the best outcome. Right? It is the best outcome in reality, and it's the best outcome for career advancement. It's the best outcome for reality because that is true innovation. You found something new, and you've provided an amazing and compelling explanation for why it is that that occurs. The challenge, of course, is that that very rarely actually happens in the lab. Right? The things that we are studying are hard problems. And so our progress on those problems is full of false starts is full of things that don't quite make sense and don't fit together, is full of trying to build a little bit on what others have done to see if you can push the boundaries of knowledge out. So we are incentivized to get a positive, novel, tidy story together, but a lot of our work is not that. Register Reports makes one change, and it is to move the primary review from after the report is done to after the design is done. So with a registered report, when the journal offers this as an uh, option, you submit the research question, justification for why it's important, why this needs to be studied, and the methodology you're going to use to study it, spelling it all out for how it is that this will advance our knowledge, whatever the outcomes are. The editor and the peer reviewers evaluate, is it an important question, and is the methodology a quality methodology to test that question? Do we need to know the answer? And if they agree that those things, are, this is important and the methodology is strong, then they provide in principle acceptance to the article at that stage. What that means is, as long as you follow through with what you agreed to contractually with the editors of what the research will be, and you conduct it competently, they will publish it regardless of outcome. So this changes the incentives in a couple of key ways for authors and for reviewers. For authors, my goal is no longer to get the most beautiful, sexy results I can because I don't know what the results are going to be. My incentives are ask the most important questions that I can and do the best methodologies that I can do to test them. For reviewers, the incentives are also different. When I'm asked to review something in my field, the first thing I do is check how many times I'm cited. Second thing that I do uh, is look at whether the claims that are made are consistent with the claims that I've made or inconsistent. And if they're consistent with my claims, then this is a great paper. The methodology is perfect, publish it. If it's inconsistent, there are a lot of problems with that methodology that make this not worthy of publication. In the register reports context, I have no idea what the results are. My incentives are make that methodology as good as it can be, because I really believe in the phenomena that I've studied. And so I want it to be a good test 
of the questions that are relevant to me.